Victoria, I got you. A Ayukui Neck now, Victoria Carlson, Shregon, mate, Wametchok, Terrakich Ock, Napicho as a walk, Jimmy James, Nakuchas a walk, Josephine James, Nachek, Noreen Jones, Nape Setch, Harold Jones, Ninas, Pradesh Carlson, Namate Por, Josie, Eileen, Essie McKenna, um, Namurm Cal, Squeet Sanina Peck, um, Kalt Hawk Kumik Yurok Language Program. So um, I said, my name is Victoria Carlson and I come from the village of Shregon and I live at Turwer, which is um, also known as the Klamath Glen. So um, if you know where Klamath, California is, that's just a few miles in. Um, my grandfather was uh, poor Jimmy James and Josephine James, and my mom is Noreen Jones, and my father is Harold Jones. My husband is Pergish Carlson, and my daughters are Josie, Eileen, and McKenna, and my son is Cal. And I said, I feel good today, and, um, and that I also work for the language program. I'm the um, current coordinator, and um, have been working for the language program for quite some time um, as a curriculum specialist, as a language specialist, and currently the language coordinator. <clears throat> Keech Way, Kelt Maki, James. Nick Maki, yes. Hey. Are you a queer, Nick now, James Jinsaw, Rick Way, as he sat ass, as he star one amount, Nick Pulik Law, as he net Kim. Uh, Talawa or uh, Yon talk it, Yon talk it, and i Kim do. Um, per work, each arc wake car, Kicha Hawk Kumaka, per work, as he McKinley Bill was school lek, as he a Kua Pulik Law, Pulik Law was Sant, Kuyurok tribe. Ne check well, uh, Sharon Reed, Nip such well, uh, walk Oscar Jinsa Jr., uh, Nikuchos well, uh, I walk Josephine, I see Irene, the peach was well, I walk Oscar Sr., I see Richard, Keach Tewa Mashkok Waka, I see Namurm, Namurm well, James Jinsaw Jr., I see Che Gotnep, I see Name, well, Testia, Testia, um, Kicha Hokumasa, Yurok Tribe Language Program, um, uh, 2006. Uh, Hesek, Hesek, 2006. So my name's James Jinsaw uh, Sr. I come from the villages of Rekwe, Sa'as, and Starwin. I'm a, I'm a Yurok downriver Yurok person, and I'm also Talwa, Talwa from the villages of Yon Talkit. Um, Feel pretty good today. Um, my family come from the village. I already said came from the village of Rickway, South and Starwin. But uh, my mother is Sharon Reed. Um, my father's the late uh, poor old Oscar Dinsa Jr. My grandmother was Awak Josephine. The poor uh, late Josephine Jinsa. I see Irene. Um, and the peach was. Is the poor late Oscar Jensa Senior, S.E. Richard Pennington. Uh, my children are James Junior. Um, my youngest is Che Gottnep, four point buck. Um, and then my daughter is Testia, which means strong wind in Talawa. And I'm very happy, very happy to be here. I've been working in a Yurok language program since I started as a college intern and. 2006, 2005, 2006. And so um, I'm real happy to be here. So that's uh, our introduction. Great, excellent. Uh, thank you for your introductions, uh, Victoria and James. Um, I would just like to take a moment to um, uh, welcome everyone to our session. If you're just joining, this is our first session of the Breath of Life 2021 Symposium. We are offering this series of online presentations in place of our Biennial Breath of Life Institute since we were unable to hold it in person. 
Um, for now, till the end of November, we'll have a presentation like this twice a month on topics related to language revitalization offered by Native individuals and organizations like the Yurok Language Program. And uh, whether you've attended Breath of Life Institute um, prior to joining us or not, we hope you will learn something that you can share with your community's language revitalization efforts as well. I'm your host for today, Carly Tex, Executive Director for ICLS. Um, I'm Western Mono and also working to sustain my heritage language, which is how I became connected with the advocates. Um, uh, also, we have our co-host, Caleb Begay. Caleb, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hey, Ankila, Caleb Begay, Holyet, Takamish, Tamish, Kunta, Nikau, Nahua'e. My name is Caleb Begay and I come from the Acorn Stirring Place in Hoopa Valley. Um, I'm also Yurok and Kadup. And uh, just set the notes on everyone to see you all here. <laughs> I'll be helping with tech today. Great. Thank you, Kayla. Um, for everyone, uh, just for FYI, this session is being recorded. So if you're asking a question and don't wish to have yourself recorded, just state that before asking your question and I'll pause it. The chat box is open. If you look at the lower part of your screen, you'll see the chat box. Um, so to get us started, let's share our greetings and our languages and where you're calling in from. For today's session, we have um, our two panelists from the Yurok Tribe Language Program, and our topic is on teacher credentialing from the experience of the language program. And we've asked them here today to present from their perspective how the program was started, their experiences in developing teacher training and credentialing program. Uh, Victoria and James, by inviting you here, we hope that our audience uh, may learn from your experience and become inspired to take similar actions in their communities. So with that, I will turn it over to you to, to go right into your presentation. And um, we'll have about 45 minutes or so uh, for the presentation. And then we'll have about uh, 15 to 30 minutes of question and answer. So um, I turn it over to you. Take it away, Victoria and James. Thank you. Okay. Well. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, um, Carly asked us to be here today um, and I, to talk about our teacher training and um, kind of how the process we got our credentialing, um, you know, program started. And, um, you know, James, like he said, he was um, working in the language program around 2005 or six, and we both started working in the language program about the same time. And so it's kind of hard to just jump into the um, talking about the teacher training program without giving some um, background and some history of how we actually got there and how and who it like all the work that it took. Um, the former language coordinator, Carol Lewis, was uh, and some other language learners and advocates in the community um, really stepped up to make this happen. So we're just, I'm just happy in, to be able to be here to share their story and then, you know, and how we are. Um, and James was a part of that also. So, um, so just kind of giving a little bit of uh, information. Let's see if I can. Switch to the next slide. So I'm wanting to do that. So, so today, um, what we will go over is um, the language program um, overview. We'll be talking about the the revitalization efforts, um, the establishment of the Yurok language program and um, the long-term restoration plan and how that was developed and what, what that was about and um, the teacher training program and how that came about and um, what it looks like today. And then also the talking about the credentialing process. So those are what we'll be covering today. And then at the end, we'll have a, a Q and A session if you guys have any questions about that. So, um, you know, the, so really before the tribe was even federally recognized, um, the elders, fluent L1 fluent speakers 
you know, took it into their hands. We, you know, weren't federally recognized at that time as a tribe, but, um, you know, all the efforts that they put in, it was all from the passion and, and perseverance of wanting to carry on our language. And um, so that started in um, around the 1950s, and but really in the 1960s is really when it was really going and moving. And what the elders worked on at that time was documenting. They knew we had to document our language and we had to start recording our language. So they took it on at that time to start working on revitalization and um, doing all that that work that we ha are able to um, look back at today and listen to and to and to read and and so also another thing that they focused on was a writing system and developing a writing system, um, working with Humboldt State University and some of their staff um, there and um, you know so our language was not a a written language and. Um, so to speak, like the alphabet, but we they did um, develop a writing system to go by, which was good. So, <clears throat> um, so you know they did all that work, the the elders and um, and language advocates, lang language learners, um, and then in um, 1997, um, there's that's. The Yurok tribe became fairly recognized in 1993, and then um, they established the Yurok language program in 1997, and the mission that um, the language program worked, worked towards. So our mission is to implement a program designed to restore the Yurok language to the status of a living, flourishing language with speakers of all levels. And so... Um, who worked in the language program at that time <clears throat> was the former Yurok language program coordinator, Carol Lewis. And so you'll probably hear her name quite a bit in this presentation. Um, we love Carol and all, you know, and her um, personality and just how influential she was in um, our language path. So, uh, and then with Barbara McQuillan and she was the, she's the assistant coordinator, the current um, assistant coordinator, till this still today um and she, you know uh she does a lot of work in the language she she, she she all her knowledge that she has from the past you know that she brings to the program um and to our community is very valuable and so it, we're very fortunate to have her to continue to work in our program and then um and then we have, um, there was quite a few Yurok elders that worked that, well, didn't work for the program, but, you know, um, that volunteered their time and that that made that time to work with the language program. And there's just a couple elders, um, Awok, uh, Eileen Figueroa and her daughter, um, Awok Kathleen Vigil. Um, they both were um, language supporters and, um, you know, always, willing to teach and um, willing to help. And no matter how many times they were asked, you know, how to say, how do you say this? How do you say that? So, um, you know, we always had that at that time, we had elders to be able to ask questions, to interview and to talk to and everything. So, um, <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> to kind of talk about um, the long-term restoration plan and how that came about and, you know, why it was so important to have this in place was, um, you know, Carol, she took the knowledge and she took the information from, um, you know, all the work that the, and the efforts that the elders had established already, you know, in the past. And so she took that and, you know, she was able to to also incorporate it into this long-term restoration plan. So it wasn't just a piece that we, you know, came, um, that she had come up with. So she had been able to gather all that information and um, cause she was there at the time also. So um, in 1997, some of the things that we wanted to look at was the current status of the language, you know, how many fluent speakers we had, how many were still learning the language and, and um, then also like how much knowledge of the language that the speakers had were holding, you know, so what level were they at if they did know some language. Um, 
And then just also looking, you know, assessing at the past list um, language restoration efforts, which what I was talking about, about the elders. And then um, just looking at, you know, those factors limiting effectiveness of language instruction, you know, what were those barriers that were limiting um, people from getting Yurok language um, instruction? And then also the factors limiting use and access to language. So what, you know, as far as access, getting getting access to Yurok language. And so, um, you know, how addressing those factors. And then also looking at the priority, you know, of the needs. And, um, and so um, after those were just some of the things that were surveyed and that were found, some of the things that I wanted, I thought were important points to share, but there was also quite a few other information that was gathered. Um, but from the, all the information compiled, um, the language program was able to establish a long, um, a long-term restoration strategy, which, um, you know, we were, that was um, able to get carried out and we're actually going to be working on creating a new one. So um, it takes, you know, quite a, some time to get where we want to be, it always feels like, you know, there's always something to do in language and I, you know, it's this, um, and that's okay. So we're just able to create new ones. <clears throat> Some well, of the things, or well, go ahead, James. Yeah, if I can add on to uh, some of what Victoria was talking about, like the effort starting back before the Yurok tribe became an established government, you know, back in the 60s and uh, developing that, the the language and documenting it the there were there were some issues because like with the writing system because the writing system that the university wanted to use was like a it was they called the American Indian Unifon which goes for all languages all Native American languages in the whole United States so we're all so different and so there was a you know, there were some problems with that because we all have different sounds and and different expressions. So, but then the uh, Yurok tribe became established as a federally recognized government in 1993. And so, you know, the Yurok tribe council and our constitution really um, thought it was imperative that language, you know, the language program, we needed to have one. And so it was one of the first things that was developed under the the new government, the new Yurok tribal organization, and uh, yeah, 1997, and one of the things that uh, the elders really thought was, you know, important was by the year 2010, uh, we were going to have our first immersion camp because um, there was former uh, linguist, you know, that worked with the Yurok language program in the past in the 50s and 60s and stuff and they predicted like by the year 2010 that the Yurok language was going to be extinct because all of our speakers were elderly you know they're in the, their late 60s 70s and 80s and so like they said by the year 2010 all the elders would have passed on by then and uh you know there was no new kids learning the language and so like that was one of the serious talks that we had started that started in 1997 like we need to have a plan we need to have a plan on and how we can you know save our language how we can you know pass on that legacy that those elders have endured so much to 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 save and so uh just kind of wanted to add that part in there as well okay so. and i think one year later 1990 no two years later 1999 we end up getting our first uh, high school language class at uh, Hoopa High School in Klamath Trinity School District. I'm not sure if it's in the slide there, but. Um, so just, um, you know, talking about some of the different um, activities that the language program, you know, I th we always talk about it in our language, you know, if it's a event or something that we hold is that, you know, we've all, we've all built these relationships and, you know, when we incorporate your language or, you know, our passion for wanting to carry on the language, you know, I really feel like um, 
we are a family in our own, you know, way. So we, um, so some of these things that we have that, you know, gathering. So this picture on the top right here, that's actually James and I, that was, I think the first language institute that we, um, that we held. And so I still remember that. And we were up, we were doing like, you know, kind of TPR stuff, interactive activities, doing language. And so, um, and then uh, in the middle here is just like a group picture we would take afterwards, you know, being able to um, really, you know, remember those times and stuff. And, uh, and then also like the language camp, we, we went to Wolf Creek Lodge here and went to, um, had a language camp here not too long ago. And, you know, it's where we, um, we have the language camp and the people bring their families and their children. And, you know, we try to incorporate, um, you know, things that are fun and, you know, able to wanting still to, to continue to learn. So, um, so for, you know, all of the, James, did you want to say something? Or, yeah. And so, and I think uh, just kind of tie back full circle, uh, you know, here with Eichel's is like, you know, after we did our, our first couple of years of trying to figure out, you know, where we were on the health continuum, the language health continuum. One thing I was really instrumental was Eichel's because Carol, Carol uh, worked with, uh, Carol Lewis worked with Eichel's and was really inspired by the master apprenticeship program. And starting from 2002 to 2005, there was a the Iraq language program created its own master apprenticeship based upon the Eichel's method. And, uh, and then we started working with our elders and uh, well, this is before my time, but we had groups that were working with our L1 speakers uh, and documenting uh, language and making videos and audio recordings and so and then in like Victoria said in 2005 to 2008 that was our first our first couple um, our teacher institutes uh, we, we said we you know one of the things that we need to do in order to sustain our our Yurok language is we need to invest in teachers we need to get teachers out into the classroom and where we are as your people, we're kind of spread out we're, what we call like the triangle. And uh, so we have like, you know, our North area on the, on the coast or, or, you know, near Crescent city, Klamath. And then we have our Southern part, you know, by Eureka, Arcata, McKinley Bell area. And then we have our, our up the river part, what we call the East area. So we're kind of spread out. And so, you know, it takes an hour and a half to get to each place, you know, and so from any part of the triangle. And so uh, we're like, we need to build teachers. And so that was part of why in 2005, we said we need to develop a teaching program. And part of this teaching program, we incorporated um, classroom management skills, uh, lesson planning, curriculum development, and also really focusing on our partners from uh, UC Berkeley on learning, you know, more of that advanced grammar, advanced morphology and syntax of the Yurok language. And then also um, mixing that with our fluent speakers. We still had about 10 to 12 fluent speakers that were still L1 speakers that were still working with the program at the time and, and really documenting the language, coming up with lists, working on online database and, and dictionary. And so that started from 2005 to 2008. And then I can keep going on to the program, but I'm gonna get back to here because I think it all kind of blends together. You know what I mean? So it's kind of hard to like talk about everything. Yeah, I mean, um, it was, I don't know, you know, out there, how many tribes um, of you have still have your fluent speakers and, um, you know, James and I were brought on, when we were brought on, we still had fluent speakers, L1 speakers to, like I said, ask questions, but we knew the numbers. We could start counting them on our hands, you know, how many speakers we had and how, and so it just felt like that, you know, rush to what can we ask them? We have, we have to ask them everything we could think of, you know, and so, 
and we just started compiling lists and lists and lists. And um, even though we knew at that time we wouldn't be able to edit them or get them all out, there was like more of the urgency of we got to collect this these recordings, um, you know. And so that was um, something that you know we feel really fortunate to be able to have been a part of at that time, because um, you know like people who learn your off language today is going to be have to learn from second language speakers but which is you know at least we were able to have the opportunity to um, work with l1 speakers and you know able to um, record them so that way um, us second language speakers can you know really get the feel of the language and the true meaning behind it and so um, that's what we like to try to also emphasize when we teach is like you know, we're not just teaching the word, but also the the real meaning behind the word. And so, um, so, <clears throat> uh, so just to kind of go, you know, so like James said, that you know, we they established a teacher training institute, and at first it started out, it was three weeks, um, a three week institute. Well, it was two weeks um, institute, and then a week. The third week was a a camp. So it was a, like a three weeks of full on just going and learning. And um, like James said, we were trying to teach, you know, classroom management and we were creating language lessons, you know, actually having spending a whole day on how to create a, a lesson and then how to, you know, do it in our native language. And so um, those are all very important things because, you know, we do need teachers to continue growing our language and so it's great to to learn the language and to want to learn to just to speak it but then just that need for um you know as our community is we need more teachers and so what we have um was developed was and it's kind of i think it's evolving like it's just going to get better and better you know because with technology today it's like you know with the pandemic it's moved us to all virtual so um, our language program staff have all been able to work from home. We have not went into the office to work. It's just, you know, maintaining our, our um, still trying to meet our community's needs and in, in, in from a virtual, it's, a lot of it's been virtual, but um, so <clears throat> um, just to kind of talk about the, we've named it the Kilai Alumesh program. They will teach and so, um, we do open it, you know, anybody who is interested in being a year off language teacher, we're always, um, our arms are open and, <laughs> and um, willing to work with, um, you know, somebody who wants to be a, a year off language teacher. Um, one of the policies that the Yurok tribe has, you know, put in place because um, we are our own government is that you must be a Yurok tribal member or a Yurok descent. So to be able to show proof of being a descent of Yurok to teach, to actually get the teaching credential, you have to have that. So, um, so some of the things that we, we do is uh, we haven't had our language camp in a couple of years because of the pandemic, um, but uh, that was be something that we would have every year. And, um, and it's just, you know, it was always really fun and we did language games and, um, and you know, had immersion sessions, and then we always, um, always got the support of UC Berkeley. You know, Andrew, with his um, showing us his, you know, some grammatical structure of our language, and you know, teaching it in that way. And we're always able to ask questions, and you know, kind of get the whole meaning behind that. Um, another activity that we like to have are immersion pods. And immersion pods are um, the constitute immersion pod is um, you have to have at least three people, and and we were in person it would be two hours, you had to be in, immersed in your language for two hours, and we would list out different activities you could do that would you know um, be helpful in immersion pods. Um, that has been something we've been able to continue um, through. Um, this pandemic is our immersion pod. So you'll see this picture I have here. I don't know if James knew I screenshotted it, but um, so <laughs> James and I and um, Analia, and that's my little nurmerm there. That's my son um, during immersion pods. And so we, it's for now that we're online, we do it for one hour just because it's, you know, it's a lot to be on the computer, especially if 
you know, if you have to already work from your computer and then um, jump on it in the evening to do an immersion pod. But the one hour is very doable. We do it. Um, and it seems like it goes by pretty quick. You know, there's some times where it doesn't, but you know, most of the time it does. And we end up feeling really good after, um, you know, getting out of an immersion pod and you're just like, your mind's still in that, you know, language realm and um, thinking, you know, about um, the next one. And so uh, those are really helpful, <clears throat> especially if you, um, you know, sometimes the language is in your head here and you can make it up, but getting it out your, you know, getting it out of your mouth is a little bit different. So these times are, you know, you um, build those safe and comfortable environments to be able to speak the language is always um, helpful in learning. And, <clears throat> and to add on to those immersion pods, like the reason we created those is, is we started teaching in the schools kind of early. We started getting into um like Hoopa Hoopa High School, McKinleyville, Del Nor, and early college of the Redwoods. And we started teaching. So like we started developing all these units so that all the teachers from all the sites they can go and pick up a unit on basket making or clothing or food. And they can have their two week lessons all developed in there, their flashcards. So we started developing that in our teacher institutes with our teacher candidates back in uh, 2000 and 2008 or 2009, somewhere in there. And then, uh, and then you know, the AB 54 passed. And so, uh, and that law um, gave the tribes a sovereign right to um, develop their own teaching program and credential their own teachers, which we already started developing that program four years before AB 544 was passed. And so, but then it's like we had all these years of teaching in the classroom and we were kind of like stuck on this plateau where like, we're like teaching new people all the time, but the teachers weren't really developing their fluency as much and we kind of got stuck. So we, we had this brainstorm where we're like, well, what can we do about this? And so at first we called it a language nest and then a and is like, you can't call it a language nest because that's that's a new thing that's in Hawaii and they call it so we're like well we're gonna call it a pod then and so the language pods were developed and we still had lots of uh of our elder speakers you know all, all of our teachers and so we invite the elders there and it was like we were at the tribal offices and we're like okay nobody is talking you know English speaking English for two hours and even if you know, the tribal chair calls you, you know, on the, on the work phone, we're only answering the door on the, on the phone all in Yurok. And so it, it was really, really fun. And um, like I said, it was like, you're flipping that switch, you're turning that switch on. And then it's like, every time you leave, it's, you're like, all your thoughts in your head are in, in the target language. And it, it was so cool. Then we saw, we started seeing um, a development of new speakers. You know, we did that for 2009 to 2015. Well, we're still doing the pods, but, you know, like we went from having, you know, zero second language speakers. By the end of it, we had um, like 24 conversationally fluent speakers. And, uh, and it was just in the right amount of time because, you know, during that time span, like we kept losing all of our L1 speakers. And currently today we have zero first language speakers, but we have about 35 new conversationally fluent speakers. And a part of that growth was developing our teachers and then our immersion pods. Our immersion pods played an important role in, in that process. And um, yeah, so, you know, it was, a, it was a big thing. And then 2012 to 2015, um we created we had our half day immersion school at the Witchpeck magnet school and and we developed a lot of immersion curriculum for our teachers we had all the pe k through fourth grade california standards for pe art um what else was there pe art science all those were developed 
in the Yurok language. So we started creating all these curriculum units. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty neat because we had to come up with words like for photosynthesis and, and things like that. It was, it was really, it was hard, but it was inspiring uh, at the same time. And so, um, and uh, during this AB 544, we had to develop our own teaching tests. And so when we developed our teaching tests, we we're looking at, I guess, what they call like the act full scale now, you know, the language health continuum scale. And so we're like, okay, if this is our overall goal, we're trying to get our teachers and our and speakers to, you know, an advanced mid or advanced high speaking level, like how can we map that out? And so we started developing um, our, our teacher, our teacher test. And so we said, well, let's have three levels, you know, um, a basic teacher, you know, it's just teaching basic Yurok and then we'll have a more advanced test. Well, you know, and all the teachers should be able to do X, X, Y, and Z. And then we're like for the, the lifetime credential for the, the third part of that California teacher credential, um, we want them to be, you know, just be able to say almost everything, you know, I mean, not like the elders, but, you know, like be able to talk and talk and talk and talk. And so uh, we use that as our map to develop our, our tests. And that's the cool thing about AB 544 is it, uh, it gave us, it gave the tribes the flexibility to say, you know, this is our language and how are we going to get it out to our children? How are we going to get it out to the public schools? And so, and using that tribal sovereignty. And so um, our tests include a big part of it has to, uh, a written portion um, where it has a, uh, grammar and, and a bunch of linguistic, um, I guess, testing parts of it. And then, then we have audio translations and let me know if I'm going too fast, Victoria. We have, a, we have audio translations on there where um, our teachers have to translate elder first language speaker audio. Um, we also have, uh, we had a speaking portion where there was a, we created this big poster and it had all these traditional activities going on, hunting, fish at basket, basket making. There was, we created on Photoshop and had a whole bunch of things going on. And so then we had our teacher candidates that are, you know, are, are taking the test. They had to like talk about that, what was going on in that picture for, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. And so like, uh, it was a really complex and that's just the beginning test. And then we, then we kind of added on to that test more and more each time, you know, more grammar functions, got into storytelling, and uh, still, we thought a big part of that was uh, uh, elder translations, like elder audio was really, really important, was that was a high focus in those in those testing areas. And so I think to this day, I think we have about 50, at least 15 or more credentialed uh, teachers through uh, the state of California. And so that's a little bit of my spill. I'll let send it back to Victoria. Gooey, Kassan. Um, <clears throat> so I wasn't working, there was a little, uh, some time gap where I wasn't working in the language program. And um, that's why I thought it was so important to make sure James was here today because he was working in the language program at that time. Um, and so, you know, he was able to talk about, you know, the, when Carol would have to go down South to, you know, work with legislation. She was like doing that work with the policies, you know, and um, working within the government. And so she was also partnering, um, making sure that, you know, she was working with tribal council. So she had that support of tribal council. So she would, um, you know, schedule um, planning sessions with tribal council to make sure that she had their support and that you were, you know, of course, everybody, um, everybody recognizes the importance of language. And so, you know, but making sure that they are helping, you know, 
develop and be a part of this, you know, is also important. So, um, just wanted to add that. Um, and, you know, our language program is not like, you know, we have, there's been a lot of work that our language program has done in the past years and has been very successful in, you know, being awarded grants to create curriculum and to create our frameworks and um, to do a lot of work towards teaching Yurok language. But um, we've always, so we've always still always been a small staff. We've always had just like, you know, three or four of us um, in the language program. And so, uh, but currently I just wanted to list out here, you know, we currently have, you know, myself, um, Victoria Carlson and Barbara McQuillan, um, James Jinsaw, which, uh, and Brittany V. Hill Burbank, um, and Erica Peters down there on the bottom. But, um, it, you know, in language, in our language world, we have to, you know, wear these double hats sometimes where, you know, I might be the manager of the language program, but, you know, I'm also teaching the language or helping, you know, um, do other stuff, helping create curriculum or getting things out, you know, it's always, um, like I said, something to do, but um, Barbara and James, they also work for the language program, but they also um, teach Yurok language at the uh, local high schools. So Barbara teaches um, levels one through four at the Del Norte High School, and James, he teaches Yurok languages one, levels one through four at Eureka High School and McKinleyville High School. And then he comes to the Yurok language after, you know, after they're done teaching, all till 12 or however their schedule is, um, then they come to the language program to work. So um, it's really important to have those key people who have the passion and who will do anything to want, you know, to keep our language going. And so it's just great to be a part of a team to, um, you know, to, to carry out and to bring new vision to language, to bring new things, you know, not afraid to, um, to, um, to do things. And so, I just wanted to throw that out there, um, you know, and looking at all this, your, like when I look at our staff and, you know, what their qualities are, what, you know, what, what they really love to do. And, um, you know, just talking a little bit about that, you know, it's like having um, James, he brings a lot of culture and a lot of, you know, um, experience and, and heart to the program and where, you know, Brittany, she brings a lot of, like, she has a lot, she knows a lot about technology and, and creating websites and apps. And so, you know, um, incorporating interactive activities. And so, um, and, and Barbara, she's really good at the, you know, the history and the, um, and the language and care, you know, teaching us new things and, and making sure that we're staying in line where we need, you know, we need to look at, or she could, tell us about, oh, we did, we tried that and it, you know, and it didn't go so well, or we did this and, you know, so it's just really good to have that, that team um, morale in the program. And I think that really, you know, even though we're small, a small program, we, you know, we, we work with our hearts. And so um, I always tell people, you know, your off language is our job. Yes, but it is our life also. So it's not something that we're adding on top of our you know, what we have to do in addition to our, you know, daily activities. It's just something that we've worked within our, our life. And so I just wanted to talk about the importance of that. Um, if there's anything else, James, or, or if not, you wanted to say or share, and then we can just open it up for the Q&A. Yeah, and I think one of the things that really, really helped our language program, you know, was that we held the schools accountable. You know, the, there, there was uh, findings in the local school districts that, that talked about, um, the, you know, that talked about racial discrimination um, in the local districts towards Native Americans. And we held them accountable and we developed these programs and, and made the schools pay for them. School districts pay our teachers they're, they're actually school district employees. And I think we could see your screen, Bic. So I don't know if that, uh, if you, that uh, something. 
<laughs> but anyway, like we made them accountable. So they, they pay our, our teachers at Hoopa High School. They pay the Hoopa High School Yurok language teacher. The Delmar School District pays for um, our teacher up the, at Delmar High School. Northern Humboldt uh, Union School District pays for the McKinleyville High School teacher. Eureka City Schools pays for, you know, all the classes at Eureka High School. And so that, that, that was that was a big thing. But again, as you know, like teaching one or two classes a day, I mean, now, you know, I'm a full-time teacher, so I teach five periods a day. But uh, before then, we only had like one or two classes at Del Norte or, or Hoopa High School or, or uh, Eureka High School. And so a person couldn't have a full-time job teaching the Yurok language. And so we had to like always travel from like Crescent City to Klamath to teach classes to up, up the river to Eureka. And so just to get enough to, to like take care of that. And so this last project that we've been working on the last five years since I think 2015 or yeah, 2015 is like, well, we need to have a teaching program where we pay people to go get their teaching credential in another subject, whether that's science or math or history, you know, or early childhood development and get their credential in Yurok because then, you know, that makes them more employable to the school districts so they can get that full-time job because, you know, um, you can have the passion for, for Yurok language, but we also need to, you know, put milk in a fridge and, you know, buy eggs and put gas in our, in a car. So, you know, that was a, a really, that was a thing that we wanted to do is like, we wanted to reward people that are out there fighting the good fight, trying to save language and revitalize language and culture, but still take care of their families. Cause that's a really important, you know, cultural value, taking care of your family. And so uh, that was the whole idea of this, this last, um, this, this last grant that, that we're still in is, is getting our teachers to our dual, dual credentialed. And so that, that's a really big focus. And, and uh, you know, I know throughout California, we all have our different struggles and we all have communication um, between the school districts. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, but you know, if you have any questions on that or, or trying to advocate, you know, um to your school districts to pay your your language teachers you know like let us know we're, we're here to help so i think that's all i really have to add thank you james for that that uh offer of um advocacy and for being open to questions i'm sure there are communities in our audience um who are maybe not at the really at the point where they're ready to train teachers um, and maybe this is something that they're interested in doing uh, but they're just starting out and I see a comment in our chat box about um, citizen-led initiative volunteer um, projects and if you have any suggestions for um, a citizen-led initiative of where the tribal members are from a state recognized tribe. And uh, to add on to that, any other advice or tips for communities that are just getting started? Uh, maybe what, what needs to be in place as far as organizing a team? What do you recommend for your, your staffing or how many volunteers, um, where to seek funding and uh, so on from your experience? Well, wow, that's a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that was, that was just, we both were waiting to like, um, I think, well, what I see is really helpful is um, the, so the Yurok language program is, um, operates under the Yurok tribe education department. And so I noticed that, you know, different tribes do different things. Um, some language programs have their own department um, where we, we are under the education department. So Every two years, we update an MOU that we have with all the school districts, the local school districts. And so, you know, that gives us the opportunity to either add something, you know, that maybe we want to add or we want them to do. Um, 
or maybe it's something that they would like to add that they would want us to do, or maybe it's something that we want to take out that isn't, you know, really being beneficial. So um, really having an MOU in place is, is really important, I think, because it really holds, um, you know, holds a accountability between the language program, but then also the school districts. So there are different partnerships. Um, and I know we're talking about the teacher credentialing program today, but, um, you know, UC Berkeley um, linguist Andrew Garrett really played a, a partner in close partnership with um, the language program. So, you know, that was also a good partnership that was built. And I guess to add on to like, you know, like grassroots and developing um, your own language program, you know, I, I think that, um, and I'm not sure if Eichel's would like to facilitate something like this, but, you know, we had our elders wisdom project, which was a grassroots community thing where we got all of our, all of our speakers and our elders and our community members together to see where they wanted to go with things. And so I think even getting a language committee, you know, developing a language committee in, in your area or sending out a survey, say, you know, who's interested in language, who, you know, who has language knowledge and finding out who those key people are and inviting them to the table and then uh, having community meetings and, and come up with a long-term restoration program or, you know, a, a survey or something and then figure out like, okay, these are our goals. How can we reach that? And then just kind of having those, um, those brainstorm meetings and where everyone brings their ideas to the table. And not everyone's going to be able to teach in the public schools. And, and that's okay too. Like, you know, AB 54 passed so we can get into the schools, but we also have a tribal credential for people that don't want to go and teach K through 12th grade. You know, they, they maybe they want to teach a community class. And so like they can come in and get a tribal uh, language credential. And we put that in place too, because it's like, you know, we want to uphold the integrity of the language. That was, that was one of the things that was established when we still had our first language speakers, you know, like we got guidance from them on, you know, how to say things, what we wanted to teach and, and do that to uphold the integrity of the language and culture of, of our people. And so, um, you know, I think um, like, so what we have is if anyone wants to teach a Yurok community class, you can volunteer this and that, but we would like people that are, you know, that are, I don't know, uh, legitimate or I don't know what the key word is, you know, are qualified to teach, you know, because, um, I don't know, it's just the, all that work that the, our elders put in there to, to re, pay respect to that. And yeah, we got lots of people. So yeah, yeah I think, you know, just to add on to that, it's um, from what I, what I feel like is that, you know, it's great that somebody wants to, to teach the language, but we as a program, as a tribe, we have to ensure that we protect the integrity of the tribe of their of our language, you know, and um, and just making sure that it's getting passed on the way our, you know, our our and getting as close as our L1 speakers as we can get. So. I saw another question that wanted to, somebody wanted to know a little bit more about the pods. Yes. Yes. So um the whole idea of, of a pod is, is we wanted to put people that have had a, quite a bit of Yurok language learning already and push them to that next level. And so we had, we get a group of people that maybe have three, three or four years of language or even maybe two years, right? Or, or a year. And, the, and they're starting to get their, building up their language uh, base. And then we would put them in there with a master speaker, uh, either an L1 speaker or somebody like myself or Victoria or Barb. And we'd have them facilitate uh, 
lessons all in immersion and try to get people to talk just get people to speak for one to two hours and you know we wanted to keep it anywhere from like three to six people in a pod because once you start getting more than six people you know it's like some people could steal the show like me i talk all the time so it's like i could just blah 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 talk and talk and then you know there'll, there'll be somebody who never gets to talk at all and so like if we keep you know you know three to six people everyone gets a chance to talk and like i said when we were in person two hours you know that's a long time to speak even if in even in english you know and so but uh yeah, it's just to have an advanced teacher or something teach a lesson. Maybe it's focused on, hey, we're going to cook a meal or we're going to make a basket or we're going to make a drum, but kind of have uh, it focus on certain topics and just let's just talk Yurok. This is a this is a place that we can speak Yurok. English isn't allowed. And uh, it really did just push. It pushed us out of our comfort zone. I tell you what, it was really uncomfortable. You realize how much you don't know how to speak. <laughs> You're not allowed to speak English, but it it was necessary, I think, to save our language. Um, and we had to do it and we did it just in time when we still had our speakers left. Because I tell you what, that was some of my best memories is to being able to go sit down with my elders and and just sometimes they just be by ourselves and talk to them for two three hours just in the Yurok language and and they're no longer here so it's like you know I'm glad that we were able to establish our pods when we did and uh you know and that was all from community input like like you said like how do I establish how do we establish our a grassroots pro language program or you know a language program all those came from ideas from the community. And when we all get together and it's like, okay, this is a problem, how can we solve it? And then we're like, that's a good idea, but what if we did it like this? Or what if we change this? And so, yeah, um, that's kind of what the pods are. I don't know if you need any more clarification on that. Um, at the beginning, we did record all of our sessions. And so, and it was at the beginning, maybe it was like, we're only speaking for 10 minutes. Then the next time we're speaking for 30 minutes and there's maybe more instruction in there. And then, then we're moving up to an hour. And then by the end, everyone's talking for two hours in the, in, in the target language. We have a question about, um, Let's see, can you speak about the experience of teaching in the high schools and how the language impacts the students, native and non-native? Well, I've been teaching in the schools for 13 years now. Um, starting 13, 14 years, started at early college or Redwoods. And and that was that school was it was a charter school uh, based based in uh, Klamath there on the Yurok Reservation. And a lot of those, that was a lot different than teaching in the mainstream like Eureka High School. You know, on a reservation, right, we had smaller classes of like seven or eight people. And so I was able to focus really a lot more on immersion. And uh, we also were on the reservation so we could go fishing. We could take the kids fishing and talk about fishing in the language. We could take kids eeling, you know, we would work on canoes and canoe building. And so, um, and, you know, you, you grew up with their parents and you grew up on a reservation. You saw them fishing all the time. So going from there to teaching in, in like a mainstream high school, like Eureka High School, that's the biggest school that we have that teaches Yurok or that has Yurok construction there. And uh, it's, it's totally different. Um, you have 35 kids in a classroom. You know, I have three periods. You know, I have 100 kids there, you know, in my, in my classes at Eureka High School. And so it's like a lot more diverse. And, uh, 
you know, about 50% of the students are native, but only a quarter of them are Yurok. And so, you know, you, we have, you know, Hoopa students, Kadaruk students, you know, people that are Blackfoot or from a different Native American class, but they're like, oh, I, you know, I want to take, I want to learn about Native people because I am Native. So that sense of pride, we see a lot more kids. There's, we're in a, we did a five-year study and there's a, there's a, there's a book coming out. It's not all the way published yet, but it was uh, based on teaching an indigenous language, Yurok, in, in the school systems. And we're going to continue that study with mental health and how the mental health benefits for the next five years. So we're really, uh, we're interviewing, we interviewed, I think about 60 to 70 different students in the, in the local areas. And, uh, you know, it has a positive effect on school attendance, graduation, um, you know, bringing families closer together. Kids are going home and they're teaching, teaching the, their families and kind of rebuilding um, or mending, mending those, uh, those traumas from like boarding school. I think it's a, it's a really good tool to do that because, you know, with native people, we have, we have negative energy that's attached to school, to public schools, to boarding schools. And I think, you know, reconnecting students in a positive way to school, into language, into teachers that look like them, to hearing their own stories in mainstream schools. Like, you know, it's, it's giving kids motivation to go to school and to graduate and, and uh, to learn their language. I think that's really powerful. We have another question about um, the starting point for the teachers, uh, for the persons that are teaching or credentialed. How many years is it taking for people to get to credentialed status from beginning learners? Uh, well, so a few years, uh -huh. you know, because I think what they say to, uh, there's a study out there that says, that you need like 2000 plus hours of, you know, from not learning it, the language, not knowing a single word, 2000 hours of immersion to like get someone to be like fluent. And so <laughs> that's a, that's a long time. That's a lot of hours of just immersion. So, you know, and we know like people that are <laughs> learning language, you know, they have full-time jobs, they have kids, they have families. And so it really depends on how much work you people put into there. You know, we see some people um, three, four years, some people more. Um, yeah, it really, really depends. And, and, and then an environment, you know, like when you have 35 students, you know, you can't do as much immersion with 35 students and you have to, you know, you have to really limit to what you teach, but if it's in a community class, like I came from a community class and uh, it was, didn't, it didn't seem like it took me very long, but it was, you know, we had fluent speakers, you know, you have a smaller environment. Um, so you, you don't have that embarrassment, you know, if I'm saying it wrong. So it really depends on, on the environment and the energy that people have to invest, I guess. But I, I think with this last program, we have had lots of people have only had one or two years of Yurok and they became conversationally fluent. And in probably the five years that we, we've been operating this new grant. So four to five years, you know, with not doing Yurok every single day, but, you know, a couple times a week. So really with the approach and method that you use, I guess. Um, we have another question uh, for either of you. If you have any recommendations or strategies for the tribal communities who are working from written and or recorded materials to learn and teach their ancestral languages. And this actually will, this actually will tie the whole talk into Breath of Life because a lot of our Breath of Life attendees uh, are learning languages from written and recorded archive materials. So do you have any recommendations or strategies for them? 
Um, well, I don't, <clears throat> I guess if you have um, some written material, you know, it's always, you have to look at who has written it and what, you know, looking at their writing system and what they used. Um, and then, you know, making sure listening to the audio, but um, I would say probably start with trying to find to work with the linguist or trying to, um, you know, find someone in your tribal community who wants to go to be a linguist. Um, it really does help, you know, when you're looking at the structure of your language. And I know I've heard it from um, some learners, uh, like Barbara will share, you know, when they first started working with the um, elders, how you know, they didn't really know why the words or the verbs would change at the end, you know, and it was because it was talking about who, who they were talking about or who was involved in the conversation or who the, um, you know, who was it directed to. So at that time, but then through um, looking at the structure of our language, working with um, different linguists, um, we we're able to capture like how it changes and all of a sudden, you know, oh, you can change with this verb, it can change with this verb and you can do this and, you know, it just grows um, and it grows. And so, and then you, if you have the audio to back, you know, to back some of that up, then that really is helpful. Um, but just, it, you know, taking the time to sit down and write it down and to, um, to, to make sure you have it all in place, you know, in a certain, you always have your master copies, but then you always have your, like your edited. So never met, you know, never touch your master copies, just your, your edited ones. And so. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's important. You know, at the beginning we were like, we just had to develop it. And so then over the years, you figure out which ones work best and, you know, like, uh, I think if there's any audio recordings, learning how to use different editing software, um, like digitize, if, well, nowadays, a lot of institutions that have it, they're already, they already have a digitized copy, getting a hold of that digitized copy. And then either, you know, like what we did is we, we uh, would take certain ones, we'd edit certain words or phrases that we wanted to use and incorporate in the lessons and just develop different lessons if you can like there's a lot of like how to how to make a you know like a simple app and just include it in an app or whether it's a tiny tap or maybe you just have a picture and has you have your words and maybe it's body parts and and then you just create it and then tap on there and then hear the sound um just really you know, making it fun, um, taking, you know, if it's just written words, put it out there so people can see it, start labeling things in the homes or, or put the recordings out there to make it, um, to make it, a attractive to, to young people. That's one of the things I feel as a teacher is like, I like telling stories and I act things out. I crawl on the ground and sing and dance and all the stuff to my high school because I'm, I'm like competing against the iphone freaking 12 right so it's like you know it's like you 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 have to um you have to attract your audience and so taking those those written sources and or those audio recordings just getting out there i i know it's such hard work um and you know, I don't envy all, all of you guys' hard, you know, what you guys have to do if you don't have any fluent first language speakers, because we are fortunate to have language speakers, but it can be done. Um, there's lots of pro programs that have, you know, just work from, you know, audio recordings and documentation. And so just getting it out there and, and teaching what you know, and that's okay. I only, you know, I only have X amount of recordings just getting, making them accessible. I think that's the, the, I guess the first step. Yeah, I think what James said, you know, making it fun. I work, I mostly teach, um, I don't really teach at the high school level. I'm more of the um, kindergarten through eighth grade kind of, um, I teach at that level, but, um, you know, making it interactive and fun like with the games and stuff and we've been able to have to develop that online these kind of like same games we would do in person some of the apps that um we use like i know james james uses a uh, quizlet 
and um, there's like wordwall.net. Those are all good sites to like, you know, create interactive games. Um, the memorize, Dot com. Um, there's quite a few apps or, you know, websites out there that we actually pay membership. Some are, you know, worth getting a membership for some are the Canva, canva.com, creating lessons using Canva. We definitely use Google Slides and sending links so people can like move the little things, you know, on their end when we say ask them to do something in Europe. So just trying to make it as interactive as possible. And um, the students love games. So that's like been one thing. It's like, if they know they can play a game, I'm like, all right, well, we got to learn it first, then you get to play, you know, then we can play the game to make it fun. So, um, but then, you know, James uses um, also the where are your keys method. So if you, you know, that's a really good method in um, teaching, you know, along with TPR and those um, other methods. So. Yeah, and and uh, during the pandemic, that uh, really pushed us out of our uh, out of our comfort zone and actually force us to, to really dive into online um, online classes, online uh, interactive lessons. And so like we just started pushing out videos, pushing out interactive lessons and getting them out there, making YouTube videos and um, getting them out there and so or doing you know what we're doing now like a zoom you know i can still teach where are your keys i find out if i share my screen and ask questions doing that interactive not really in person it's still not as fun and as you're in person but you know i might be a little biased but yeah it's still uh it, it made us that's i guess the one good thing that came out from this pandemic is it really helped us reach those people that don't live, you know, physically near the reservation or near where we're having the community classes. And so we started getting new language learners. You know, I have people that were from Canada that show up to the language class and I'm like, well, oh, this is cool. And they're really good learners. And they're like, I want to learn more and more and more, you know, so you have to just like keep feeding them. So I think that's one, one good thing is, we found that blessing of, hey, we got a new way that we can reach more people. And uh, uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I, I don't think we would have went as fast that way, you know, because like we get caught up in life, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Victoria. Again, um, everyone, let's, let's give them some appreciation round of applause emoji of your choice give them a heart clap 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 we have some comments in the chat looks like you're getting a lot of love in the chat um i just wanted to be respectful of the present presenters time and i i know we didn't get to everyone's questions um but i think this is a good place to to wrap up um so in closing I just want to say that uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. I think you've given us a clear outline of your program from the start to where it is today and address some of the challenges that you faced and how you overcame them. I feel there's definitely information in here that other communities can learn from. And I know it's not easy to put yourself out there to talk about it and uh, to talk in, in front of such a large audience. So I appreciate you for doing that. And we, we at Eichels appreciate you for sharing your experiences today. With that, we'll close today's session out. Manahubu, thank you to everyone for joining. Take care, enjoy the rest of your day, keep using your languages. And as James said, teach what you know. Oweno, and we'll see you next time. Two. Two. Oxo for having us. Oxo. Manahab. That was. Sadia. <laughs>